Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to the Mindset Conquest podcast, where every week I'll be joined by a special guest who will be sharing what they've experienced as the biggest failure in their life, but most importantly, the lessons that they've learned from that experience. I'll be spending time with people that I've met throughout my life's journey in business, music, and sport. And the goal is to provide listeners like yourselves with the motivation needed to get through all of life's challenges and learn not to be afraid of failure, but rather to embrace it. Please like and subscribe and enjoy this episode. I'm Chris Atwell. On today's episode, I'm joined by Harmon MCJD Mundare. Harmon has been in the music industry for over 25 years, and he's currently the CEO of his record label, I Smash House. He's an active community member known for mentoring youth, and you can find him steadily recording for projects with many top names in the Bangra, hip-hop, reggae, and drum and bass music industries. When he's not making music, he's a manager of marketing operations and technology for a leading Canadian staffing firm. Welcome to the Mindset Conquest podcast. I got a very special guest with me today, Harmon Mundare. Harmon, how you doing? Doing amazing, man. Blessed to have me here. Thank you very much for everything, bro. You know, third time's a charm. Finally made it. Good, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We tried to connect over a couple of weeks here. Things happened. It got in the way, but I'm yeah. very appreciative that you made it today. You know, why don't we start by uh, sharing a little bit about who you are, where you're from, and what do you do in life, man? Who, who's Harmon? All right. So well, that, that's a loaded question. So yeah, I bet. I see, I've seen on your LinkedIn profile and, and you and I have known each other for years. You've got a lot yeah. going on. Man. There's a <laughs> lot going on, man. I, I, I'm a man of multi-hats. So Harmon there, a.k.a. MCJD, my alter ego, my nemesis, my inside devil. So there's MCJD, the musician. Um, there's Harmon Mundair, the IT professional, business professional. And then mm-hmm. there's Harmon, uh, who does, who runs a rec- record label as well. And then there's also, I'm on a board of directors for Kaladin Soccer Club. So right. I'm the director of marketing sponsorship and grants over there. Um, on top of that, just, you know, helping people build business, uh, public speakers, still doing events, still emceeing, you know, got a full studio here, the devil's there, still recording as well. So that's in a nutshell, without going too deep, that that's what I do, you know, professionally and on a personal level. So you got, you got your, your, your passion of music. You've got this profession of IT that you've grown a career out of. You do a lot of volunteer work for children and kids when it comes to youth and, and, and soccer. You got a recording studio and a label. How, how do you manage your time? Like it, it just seems like you got so much going on. That's a lot of people ask me that. It's, it's kind of crazy, man. Like I was, I was trying to look at this as well, but organization, man, like whiteboards as you can see back there white door boards and sticky notes man like sticky notes for days so <laughs> i have color coded sticky notes for things that i want to organize and i prioritize um i usually prepare in the morning where i'm setting up daily tasks and goals especially when i get in the office of things i need to do and prioritize that's how my business day starts and then throughout the day if i have some spare time throughout the day i'll, I'll pick up on the emails for the volunteer work and then any artists that want to get in the studio I try to arrange time with them, but they're kind of lower on the totem pole. So, yo, guys, I do apologize. I'll be no catalyst, all those guys. I apologize to you, but I will make time for them. I, but it's this balancing act and plus kids as well, right? So I'm committed. Soccer kind of goes hand in hand with my kids because I got to make time for them. Daughter's drum lessons, son is soccer. You know, I, I, I try to balance with family as well. It's, it's not easy, but it's not about having time. It's about making time. Everyone has time, but it's about making time and prioritizing that time. Yeah. I mean, that's what it's all about. You need to understand what your priorities are and, you know, do, do what's most critical one thing at a time. Most definitely, man. Yeah. Yeah. Where'd you grow up, man? Born and raised in Brampton. Oh, you would never have guessed. But yeah, yeah I was born, <laughs> born and raised in Brampton. That's why I call myself Canadian. I'm like... I'm not really Indian. I'm Canadian, man. I'm like a Canadian born, but I am Indian by, you know, by, by birth, but yeah, born and raised in Brampton, uh, French immersion. And we were talking about this earlier. Yeah. I'm one of the fair, a few that speak French, uh, that was born here. French immersion from like early at Dorset drive in Brampton, nice. like the whole life been in Bramalee, Brampton boy. So that's 
kind of where I grew up, raised. Um, my parents are originally from India. I'm Punjabi. For the people that don't know, I am. You know, so they came here in '74. So and then they got married in '75. Arranged marriage. Didn't meet till the day they got married. And then wow. No, yeah, '74 they got married. And then nine months later, I was born. So my dad did not wait. He he was at it. <laughs> so, yeah, man. I imagine that was a, a common thing in in your community, right? If you're if you're if you're Punjabi uh, heritage, arranged marriage is kind of a is that a common thing? Or? Well, it's not even like Punjabi; it's South Asian in general. It's a South cultural Asian, thing yeah. too, right? It, I think there's a lot of Asians as well. It's culturally ingrained where from a young age you have two families that have a similar upbringing, similar you know, I call it the data sheet or, or the bio data, where you look at the you know education, income, you know. Right the cast mattered back then. And if you're the same cast and you have the same socioeconomical background, you're like, Hey, listen, our kids are going to be a match when they get older. That was old school days though, man. That right. has changed like tenfold. Like my, my kids are Portuguese Indian. You know what I mean? <laughs> they're, they're Portuguese, Punjabi, they're Canadian, they're all mixed up. But back then, yeah, that's what it was because my dad they were like, find a match. And then the elders would find a match and say, it's a suitable family. They'd sit down and say, and they'd negotiate the dowries and stuff. And they, you know, land, whatever it is and money and this. And then next thing you know, you get married the day of. But yeah, range bear is a crazy, wild thing, bro. I couldn't even like imagine. It's like the nine day fiance thing, but it's like, nah, it's not a fiance. You're getting married, bro. Like that's it. Like Saturday, get ready, get your boys together, done. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's an interesting concept. And, and I met a few people that, you know, were born out, out of that sort of arrangement. And they're all great people, which is cool. Um, talk a little bit about kind of your your music passion i'm very interested in learning about how this whole mcjd thing uh you know developed wow. over time so <laughs> i know we were talking about failures or, or earlier and it was like the whole you know mindset concept you're talking about but the mindset kind of triggered it because from a young age man like i i think it was grade four i was reciting like raising hell and, and fat boys and like you know, like yeah. raising hell was my like goes from kings come queens from queens come kings or raising hell like us last with the lunchbell rings. I was reciting that that remember that black tape with the teal on it. Oh and yeah, that I had that tape and that's what I played inside out. I used to, you know, I had a keyboard where I used to play little drums on it and then write my own raps. And then I used to get my little, little cousins that that had, that had like girly voice like four or five years like sing this. They'd sing it. So that's how I got started. I was like grade four, or five, grade six. Um, I started kind of rapping but obviously being the brown skinny like i look like bro i'm not gonna lie to you right now i look like paul from wonder you years meets pedro from napoleon dynamite that's why I, I had a mustache in grade five i had like big ass glasses so i wasn't the typical indian dude that you see now that i was like a geek a nerd and my dad had like a strap behind my glasses because i played sports so right. they wouldn't break i have a mark on my nose still from back then but i got that's how i got into music man like i was rapping and then it was like seeing these guys not accept you like grade six, seven, eight in the hallway rapping and you start spitting bars. Everyone's just laughing. You know, like they were laughing, like you have a circle of dudes, usually all Jamaican black dudes, whatever they're, they're doing their thing. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm like, yo, let me spit bars and I could do it, but I wasn't accepted. And I was like, yeah. you know, what? it's cool though. That's where I got started. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this. And because I knew I had talent because I could so freestyle and they got dis when they got disrespected, that's when I knew I was doing something right. When I when I was actually flowing, like yo, yo, hit me on got bars, hit me on got bars. Like that. That's when you know you're like, oh, you no, know, you get a little bit of respect here and there, and that started tweaking me a bit. So that's how I got started. Plus drum lessons, guitar lessons from a young age. My dad put me in both. I was at Walter's Music in Bramley City Center, carrying my guitar every Saturday morning for about seven years, doing that, and then drum lessons at uh, uh, Drummer's Choice, learning those paradiddles. You know, and he played tabla and harmonium. He had a passion as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, man. So that's kind of where it all started. And then that took you into quite the, the career in the underground scene uh, in Toronto, huh? Well, it, it took me into the rave scene. I think that's, that was more of a, I want to MC. And then when I went to raves, like it was like early 90s, I went to a party and saw the MC up there. I'm like, I want to be that. Because I was like, I was, I was still rapping. What I was doing, like, it wasn't really popping off. I went through like so many names, like MC OJ, Original Junglist, Scorpio nice. MC. I went through mad names and then I was just trying to make it, but it wasn't like being an Indian rapper back then wasn't a big thing. Like nobody was doing it, right? There was no Indians because all the Indian families were like doctor, lawyer. You want to do music? Across the face, straight mm -hmm. up. You know what I mean? You get, mm -hmm. I was like, no, nah, but I was kind of still French. They put me in French immersion. I was around white kids growing up. You know, I used to go up to Bell Fountain and Mono Mills for birthday parties in grade five, six, seven. 
my parents had no choice. They put me in French immersion. So it's a group, same group of kids through a French immersion. So it kind of broke the norm of me not having a lot of Indian friends. And then what they would do, they would kind of make me be accepted. And that's how I kind of got my freedom. Having that freedom got me into going parties and then going to parties. I was like, yo, I'm going to do that. And then I got the opportunity to MC at a rave. And then that was just, the, I would say the catalyst for me getting into the South Asian music scene, which was a whole, that's what kind of blew up for me. And that's what actually made me some money, right? Like, cause jungle has no money. Jungle has no pension, drum and bass rave scene. There's no money in that at all. Unless you're, you know, hustling and emceeing and promoting running a label back then wasn't a big thing, but now running a label, having the publishing, having the intellectual property, being registered with SoCan, learning the business of it now. Right. You know, you progress through it, but yeah, the hustle that I learned while I was emceeing was a grind that stuck with me even through my professional days now. So that's, that's kind of where, where I got to, man. That's like reaching the unattainable was, was my goal that that was what I wanted to do. That was the reason why I wanted to emcee. It was reaching the unattainable, getting that fame, being on on that stage and being the center of attention it was all greed like straight up like yeah like to be honest but that's what i wanted that's incredible who are some of like the the, the most memorable artists that you emceed for uh oh. in your career emceed for emceed with like mc for like i've emceed for ndc i've MC, MC, like all the big djs I, i've emceed for so yeah, I've, that, seen, that, I've, I've seen you perform at, at Base Week opening for Andy C. Yeah. You know, perform with Andy C a few times. That's, that was Yeah, Andy C. I was at Wemp a couple of times at Dunville. Yeah. I emceed for him. And then I emceed, you know, I think every DJ under the sun, man, like from Ray Keith and all the UK boys and yeah. going, going on tour with Capital J for a while. You know, I was with Jay and we were on sharing stages with like, you know, everyone from Shy Effects, uh, Skiba, RIP Skiba. Like, you know what I mean? With Skiba. I remember doing shows with Stevie Hyper D back in the day. Like, it mm. was like, like being on bills with those guys was like a big thing. And like being backstage and just politicking with them and then be, seeing people or bucking people up at the airport. That was a big thing of like, yo, yeah. you're from Toronto and you're actually going to do a show somewhere. You know what I mean? And you'd be on the same show. But I think the biggest show that I, I think I could say hands down for me was when we went to Philly and Philly was, uh, it was called the Pangea festival. Nice. And it was it was Zulu Nation backstage. I met Africa Bombada. It was wow. Skiba, myself, Jay Messenian, Lauren from Philly, Cap J, Shy Effects, Papo. It was like, and it was like a three day festival. I think Tribe was on that festival. I got the shirt upstairs, man. Like it was a crazy festival. I think that was the biggest one I've been to. Where I was like, kind of like, kind of the first time being flown out for a festival to the states. And this, I think, this was like ninety nine or ninety eight. Mm. So mm. it was like early days and that kind of like kind of blew me away being in a house and i'm like there's all these artists in the house and we're just par and chilling i think that was that was kind of what kind of was the big one that sticks out of my head right now yeah that sounds amazing you know i you know you might not know this but i kind of looked up to you uh, back in those days 98 99 there was a whole bunch wow. of the, the mcs that i was i was kind of eyeing out when i was starting my my career at the time as well and and you happen to be one of those guys man and proud of hey, you for man, everything you've i accomplished. appreciate that man you know, yeah. that's a blessing you, you were an inspiration to me and i'm sure you've inspired countless amount of artists uh you know nationally and, and internationally so you know you've always carried that passion for music what got you into it well i like i said it, it kind of fell into my lap it was in i think 99 when someone asked me yo do you speak French? I was like, yeah. They're like, you want a job? I'm like, doing what? And they're like, working at Microsoft Canada. So <laughs> that's, that's how I kind of got a job at Microsoft Canada back then. And it was kind of crazy. That, that's how I kind of got into IT. I went to school for business. Mm. But it's just IT was something that just kind of started rolling. And then I went from there to, I think it was HBC and then TJX Canada. No, and then Best Buy head office and then everywhere I went, I seemed to curate my own role. Like I just went in there and I was like, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this, and I could do it well. And I curated my curated my own role. And then I think the big one was TJX Canada was when I kind of got my foothold in the IT business. Um I got an interview because my sister worked there. And then once I got in there, it was just like getting in there and just one thing that people don't realize is they're afraid to speak up and they're afraid to go against the norm. Because mm -hmm. they're afraid that people are going to say something to them or their career is going to be in jeopardy. I'm like, listen, if you've been at a job a year, a year and a half, and you have ideas, voice them. 
If you yeah. don't voice them, you're going to regret it later because those ideas someone else is going to voice and they're going to get the raise or they're going to get the promotion or they're going to get the accolade. So that's what, that's what I did everywhere I went was just, you know, I learned this at Taco Bell actually, because I worked, my cousin got me a job at Taco Bell, my first job ever. Mm. Um, and she, when she was working there, she was like kind of boxing the boss around. I got this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go do this. Like taking the initiative and do your shit. I was like, damn, I watched that. And then it was, it wasn't like a disrespect thing. The boss was like, all right, cool, cool, go do it. And then she'd come back and then whatever. And then she'd get the awards and stuff. I'm like, oh, okay. So that's how it works. And that kind of stuck with me. So that regardless of what I did, whether it was music or, or business, that's one of the main things I like that got me to IT was just taking the initiative, learning things before the internet. I had to learn things. I learned things. And then, then it was the internet that I was like, just Googling shit. They're like, yeah, you got to stage this blade server. Oh yeah, I can do it. I'm like shit, Cisco blade server. Like trying to figure out how to do this and learning it as I went, but then right. coming home and learning it even more and learn, going on to GitHub, going on to, you know, different kind of websites, going on to 4chan, going on to Reddit and finding shortcuts and finding how people are doing it, you know, learning how to code learning WordPress. Like I, I'm learning over the last COVID, um, well, the first COVID lockdown, I taught myself After Effects and Fo uh, Premiere Pro. And the, after that was just learning more and more. So then I got into, after TGX Canada was, I left TGX Canada because I was like, whatever these guys are doing in IT, they're sending it to all these vendors that are making money. So then I'm, I bucked up with some other guys and I started doing, I started doing my own IT for a bit, just as a contractor. And then I met up with some partners. They're like, yo, we're going to do an IT company. Are you down? I'm like, oh, yeah. That's when Balantech started. And, you know, shout out to Hiran and Anish, you know, even though we're not as close as we used to be because don't go into business with friends. It was good. It was a great learning experience that we made outside the box. And then we did the Hip House networking events. That was our brainchild as well. That went huge for, social, for networking events for young professionals. Right. And from there, man, it just, that's where it grew to... I got my feet wet in IT from like help desk all the way up to managed services to managing a team. And that, that was kind of my professional journey. And it kind of fell in my lap, but I just went with it, asked questions, learned shit, you know, wasn't afraid to tell someone that has more experience than me that you're wrong. You can do it this way mm -hmm. in a meeting. And people are like, huh? I'm like, well, if you look at it this way, because I have my Six Sigma, you know, I have my ITIL V3. I got the certifications as well. So I, I, did the, I put my time in. I'm learning the Agile framework right now because I'm learning. I'm trying to get my scrum. I'm learning all these things because I understand it's going to help me in the long term. And Kaizen is one of the rules, man. It's constant Always progression. Learning. Always learning, man. Always learning. Regardless of what you're doing, learn, man. Learn. That's what I tell my kids. Always learning. Yeah. Yeah. Even at my age, you still got to learn. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. So now I'm in a position where I'm not doing as much IT, but I have a hybrid role and I'm so blessed that I'm with the company I'm with right now. Big up to Anthony and the whole crew at Vertical. You know, it's been a bit amazing journey so far. Fantastic. So that hustler mentality, you know, part of that mentality obviously is, you know, grinding, getting work done, but always learning and getting those certificates and, and capturing that knowledge. It's going to help elevate you. That's really 100%, cool. percent, man. So I got the big question for you. I asked this question to everybody on the podcast. What does harm consider to be his biggest failure? whether that's in, in, in personal life or career, very curious to know, you know, what, what, what was that failure that really you took the most learnings from? I've had three failures in my life that I can pinpoint that are, that have been game changers. Um, first of all, failure to me lures success. I think that's a huge thing that I tell people without failure, you will not have a success because unless you fail, you will not know what success means because everyone lives their life to succeed, right? But if you look at the definition of failure, you know, it's the lack of success. That's so, right. So failure lures success to me. That's my personal opinion. Because every time you fail at something, you're like, crap, I want to do it better. And when you do it mm -hmm. better, you're like, shit, I'm going to do this better. It's like kicking that soccer ball in the top corner. You keep on doing it, you're going to hit it. So, uh, so the first thing I think was my dad passed away in 05. So I think one of the failures that I had with him was the, the relationship. And I, think, I don't think it was anything like, I don't dwell on it. I think it was something that I could have had that I just didn't have just because of the, the family that I was in. It was a joint family with like my dad, his older brother, two older cousins. So I never had that relationship building when I was younger. It was more my uncle that kind of ran the household at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but I know in 04, when he, when he had, we got diagnosed with cancer, he's like, do something with Punjabi people. Like stop doing this jungle, jungle music. 
he used to call me jungle dunger or you know or, or juvenile delinquent because okay. he didn't know what jd <laughs> meant either so and he was like um do something with punjabi people so in 04 i did a track with some punjabi people it hit number one he passed wow. away in 05 and i know my boy blitz called me like a day after he passed away he said yo bro your videos out in england and they're lip syncing your lyrics in it wow. and i was like my dad go my dad told me to do music with any people if i did it earlier this wouldn't have happened so that was one of the failures of just not listening to him early enough and not having that the second my failure, sympathies by the way my sympathies hey, you know what it i call it the circle of life man like I, I i appreciate that so much but i understand that people come and people go and mm -hmm. as long as and he went to something called art of living and he had closure but a lot of people don't have so it was a, it was something that he needed and it, i think it was you know no one wants to die but he was accepting of it at that point he got non-small lung cancer they gave him two years eight months later he was gone but he lived mm -hmm. and he prepared for it so you know thank you but yeah he i know he's up there smiling man so we're good second one i think is uh one of my big failures is right now i'm living it is uh my relationships because my music has jd has taken a toll on Harmon, mm. and Harmon takes the toll on Harmon deep Harmon deep is my name that i was given when i was born which i don't use Harmon is someone that's always driving to do you know always trying to get that hustle on and then jd is someone that distracts so there's different archetypes in this one body that I have. And those I've changed now to solution driven. And that being said, it's like the relationship with my kids. Um, it's not like as a normal relationship should be. Um, it's a hybrid, I call it a relationship, but it's that's something that I need to improve on, which I'm trying to improve on right now, which is a work in progress. But with all this that I'm taking on, it's kind of like balanced. And I think the third failure that I can actually tangibly tell people that I've learned from is accepting and learning mistakes are okay. Like mm -hmm. accepting it. Failure is good. Failure is fine. Like if you fail a test, it's not the end of the world. Like, you know, people in grade six failing a math test and they're like, Oh my God, I'm not going to make the university. I, I, and they get so down on themselves. You like that inner warrior that I talk about, your inner voice yeah. has so much to do with your success. And that failure should be like, there's so many cliches I can use, but it's like using stumbling blocks as stepping stones. When you, when you have those, just start building and get, get higher. That, that's kind of where, what I learned from my failures. And I think that was the three main things in my life is just, you know, relationship, relationship with my dad, relationship with my, with my kids, and understanding that my failures in life were not actually failures. They actually lured me to the successes I have right now. But it's accepting the failure it's still one of my, I hate losing, bro. I hate it. Like, I, you know, I hate seeing these young kids getting a gig before me, but I'm like, do I really want to be there? Or do you yeah. just want to see my name on that flyer? Do I just want to be on that stage with a mic in my hand? Do yeah. I just want to be VIP? You have to, and then you start thinking about why, you know, the root cause. So that, and I've learned from all the failures, one thing that I've learned, which is the bottom line of my life, control the things that are within my control. That's it. That's, uh, that's the thing that's brought me so much peace in my life right. just being willing to control the things that are within my control. Man, relationships are so crucial and, and, you know, it's, an, it's amazing to hear that the advice that your father gave you that you kind of ignored for so long, produced such great fruits in your life. That's, that's really cool. And, uh, I love the learnings that, you know, don't be afraid of failure. At the other day, don't be afraid of failure. No. Embrace it. This is where you. This is how how you you excel in life. And you know, most people don't see the struggle along the path. They only see you shine, right? They only see you shine, but they don't see the pain, the the suffering, the blood, the sweat, the tears, the challenges. They only see you on that flyer. Yeah. Right? Well, that, you know what? You know what's a great analogy for that is you know the Picasso story. You were Picasso sitting there and he's drawing a picture and they say, oh my God, that's Picasso. Picasso, can you draw me something? You yeah. sit there, doodles for 30 seconds, gives it to the lady, say, that'll be $30,000. <laughs> She's like, what do you mean $30,000? Yeah. You took me 30 seconds. He goes, yeah, it took me 30 seconds, but it took me 30 years to learn how to do this in 30 seconds. That's right. Right? It's that whole trial of getting to that point of perfecting your craft. And it's like, dude, it's so essential, man, that people understand. Like people are like, you know, why are you charging so much to MC? I'm like, 
because I've been on more stages than you got pages in your rhyme book. So like real talk, like that, that's why I'm charging. I have the expertise. I'm going to bring you something that's going to be different from someone else's it's experience, man. Experience pays. And, yeah. you know, you don't make mistakes and mistakes cost you. So when you're not getting those mistakes or the time, it's like that whole engineering triangle, man. Like I live by that too. It, it's a lot of different things, but exactly. You hit on the nail on the head, man. You know, for real, it's, it's the time that you put in equates, you know, the experience to what you produce. A hundred percent. Yeah. You couldn't have said it better. I love it. You know, along the way through this whole journey through life. Um, and by the way, thank you for sharing those, those failures, man. It's, it, it takes a lot to, to, to open up and, and share stuff that's, that's personal to you. I appreciate that. I'm sure the listeners will too, but I'm, I'm curious who are, are the most influential people to you uh, in your life? Ooh. Maybe, you know, three people that, that have really had an impact on, on harm. This is crazy. JD. Like okay. MCJD on Harmon. Hmm. If it was like, I personally, like, it's like the math, bro. Like, like the third, when like I had that, the third person, like JD like, to Harmon. Yeah. Like, like for real, like when I walked into those parties, first it was the alcohol, like, like people, I was synonymous with drinking, like excessively. And that's what gave me the energy to walk into a party and not give a fuck. Like mm -hmm. for real, I was just like getting a mashup and be like, yo, I don't care. I'm just going to. And then that kind of leveled me up to walk it in. And then I had that swag about me, which was JD. And it was a persona that actually I mentally, it was like when I used to play soccer, I used to like practice penalty shots on a, on a net. And I used to put up bottles and I just practiced. And then I, when I was going to bed, I used to think about those penalty shots. It got to JD when I was going to bed, thinking about me on stage tomorrow, what I'm going to wear, how I'm going to rock it, what rhymes I'm going to say, what, and what I'm going to be doing on stage, how I'm going to walk in. Like it was all already pre-planned that I was going to match it. So that was one thing that helped me condition my mind because you can go to the gym and condition your body, but conditioning your mind is a whole different level, man. Like it's, it's like, People wake up and brush their teeth, but they're like, why? I go, because you're conditioned to. If you don't, you're nutty. But if you wake up and brush your teeth, which you should be doing, we're conditioned to do that. And that was the conditioning I would give to myself. I was like, every night I came home, I was like, yo, I'm going to break this. I can do this. So I think JD was my first influence. Um, hmm. The second influence I would be is fame. So, sorry, that, that's interesting, by the way, because you're the first person has ever told me that, you know, the, they're... they're their stage persona had that much of an influence, but I, but I can relate with that. I kind of, you know, I'm thinking back to my absent minded days. I'm thinking back to when I was trying to develop a musical character. That's, that's me. And you kind of embrace yeah. that, but it's not a hundred percent who you are. So that was, that was really cool. Thank you. It's, it's never is man. Like it's, it's, it's a show. Mm. Like it's, it, at the end of the day, it's a show that you're putting on and that me mentality needs to be there. Um, Second one, I like it's weird. It's not really people that I the last one is going to be a person, but this one is fame. That drove me like to the point where I was like, I could do what you could do better. Right. I could be on that stage ripping it and I know I could do it better. And it's seeing all the fanfare around somebody. I wanted that. And it was like not about not having the ability to do it. I knew I had the ability to do it. Maybe not as good as them, but I mm -hmm. knew I could get that done. So that was that was a driving force that was one of my really big influences. That that, you know I mean? that who you who you really want to be was the influence, like that ultimate fame, being the center of attention. That that's yes. the influence. Okay. That led that led up to JD being created because it was like, mm -hmm. how are you gonna get there then? And when I got on stage, I just automatically it was a natural transformation into my MC mode. Mm -hmm. And then I think the third person I would say it would be kind of I would say my dad first of all, because he got, he got to a point where he's like, you know what, just do what you guys do. He's like, right. just do it. You know what I mean? Like he was like, if you want to do music, do it 110%. If you're going to do sports, do it 110%. Just, and his biggest advice, which he gives to all my friends is like, when you walk into a room, absorb the room, don't talk, absorb the room and the energy, listen to conversations, listen to people talking, watch their mannerisms, how they're reacting. If someone is the center of attention, watch what they're doing to become the center of attention, mm -hmm. see what they're saying, see how they're carrying themselves, see what their conversation is. Don't yeah. get into the conversation, just tune into that. 
and absorb the room. And I think that made me a chameleon to adapt to so many different situations. That's been the biggest influence in my life of walking into a boardroom with, you know, $50 million on the table or walking into a studio with 20 year old kids sipping lean to like, you know, going into an Indian festival with, you know, 30 huge artists, Bollywood artists, and, and still holding my own in, in any of those situations to like coming upstairs to meet my grandfather, you know, when my mom chilling out, like, you know, or go chill, chill with my kids and having a conversation with the board of directors. Right. It's all those different things where I've learned to absorb it, understand it, learn it and adapt it into my life. But naturally, organically, not mm-hmm. trying to be someone else, just organically have my mannerisms. I'm still Harmon. I'm still JD. It's still in me, you know, but having that balance, I think balance is the biggest key in life. And, you know, understanding that you can be yourself without consequence. Like there's, there's no consequence for you, you being you. Um, fear of judgment is maybe a consequence, but are you really going to let someone sway your mind thought or your brain thought or, or you know what I mean? Like your thought is your process, right? So you, you can't, that's what I say when I, I tell people create without consequence. Um, like you don't need to prove to others what you're creating. That's the beauty of music. I'm like, trust the process, man. Like the biggest thing right now, man, this is organic. It's curating content versus creative content. Those are the two biggest differences I'm seeing right now is people are trying to curate content to fit a mold. And then people are just creating content and it's falling by the wayside because the, you know, the attention spans this. So that's kind of where I'm like, just create, man. Just do what you do. And if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Don't, don't, don't force it. But I went on a bit of a tangent there, but that's kind of like, that's where it came from my influences. And that's kind of what I've learned is just to adapt. Wow. That's beautiful, man. Super interesting conversation. I, uh, you know, like I said, you were a big influence on me in my younger days coming up as an artist. And, uh, it's really amazing to connect with you and, and, and talk about your personal life, your, your, your professional life and the things you got going on right now. Thank you very much for sharing uh, your experience. Before we go, uh, curious, where can our listeners connect with you online? All right. Yo, firstly, thank you for having me, man. Like, huh, I haven't done this in a minute. Last time I was on a podcast or any kind of thing was an interview with Fever FM in the UK. So and that was talking about music shit. But I appreciate you having me, man. Uh, if they want to connect with me, um, you can check me out online, www.mcjd.ca. That's always there. Um, ismashhouse.com, my label. That's up there. Instagram, mcjdtv. Dude, I'm all over social media. That's the one thing about me. I'm like everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm everywhere. Um, if you guys want to link, link with me professionally, um, I do sit down and I do uh, kind of master classes and workshops nice. with, uh, with kids. I'm, I'm working with the Unlearned family right now to talk to some kids in school about, you know, just what I went through, exactly what I talked to with you and how I got to where I want to get to and the, the resources available. So hit me up on LinkedIn, um, Harmon Mundare. That's my real name. And, uh, and if you guys have any, com- any questions about, you know, the music business or how to start your own label or, you know, recording tools that you need or, Little things like that. I'll, I could guide you in the right direction. I, I'd rather share my knowledge than, than keep it for when I'm in my, in my grave because knowledge is no good when you're dead. So I'd rather share it with the world and let, let everyone else succeed, man. Like straight up, man. I, I just live through other people's successes. I love to see people happy and pe- people su- succeed. So yeah, that, that's it, man. MCJ.ca. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Really appreciate you. Thanks again for your time, man. And uh, look forward to connecting with you again soon. All right. All right. Awesome, man. Chris, thank you very much for having me, bro. Yeah. Take care, brother. Take care, man.